Heather, I don't think we've ever talked about a movie where there's two cuts of it and one of the cuts essentially makes it a movie worth watching and the original cut could be roughly defined as fine for the people who watched it at the time, but if you wanted to enjoy it beyond that, you really had to hunker down the movie, as it were. This is this is a first for us on the Culture Cast, and I'm excited. Are you excited about this? I, this Was this a first time for you? Yeah, I, 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 I don't even know how this movie showed up. Did you pick this? I may, maybe. I don't it, remember it how this showed up. Like, all of <laughs> a sudden, so it was like, Eyes of Fire was, I mean, I, I think you may have, I don't know. Like, I, I, there was a recording on the calendar and, you know, this year being what it's been, I just, I don't remember. So I I might have suggested it to you because when I, when I, because I saw, this was a first watch for me a year or two ago and I loved it. But I'm with you. I originally saw the theatrical cut. Yeah, we'll get into the differences here in a bit. Oh, hearty, hearty listeners. And like, he, for you guys, you, you get to join us on this journey with this amazing fucking movie. Yeah. So uh, like Heather mentioned on this episode of the Culture Cast, I'm still your host, Chris Stashy, much to the chagrin of many. And I'm joined all the way by one bodacious babe. <laughs> hey, babe. I feel like you're like, surfs, what? Surf ninja <laughs> Nazis must die. Your friend and mine, all the way from MondoHeather.com, Heather Drain. Hello, everybody. And you know you know who's more bodacious than me? Chris. I am one bodacious babe. You're right. You're one bodacious babe. <laughs> 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 And hey, everybody, uh, on this episode of the Culture Cast, we're going to be talking about a 1983 film that uh, just recently got a re-release on Blu-ray that, you know, again, kind of like I mentioned in the opening, kind of changed the movie entirely. We're going to be talking about Avery Crown's 1983 full horror film, Eyes of Fire, and the subsequent director's cut, which has a completely different title, Crying Blue or Cry Blue Sky, or Crying Blue Sky. I've seen it either way, but I believe it's I've Cry seen. Blue Sky. That sounds, yeah, that sounds right. I've seen it both ways too, but yeah, yeah. Cry Blue Sky. <laughs> what are you bringing it there for? <laughs> it was a time of witchcraft. Brish, uh, brish, uh, of hangings. Brish, uh, of horror. Uh, of magic. They were outcasts on a desperate voyage to the promised land. What they found was a terrifying world. Lost in a forest far from home. In a valley none would enter. That tree says that this valley is where the lost blood gathers. It's the home of the devil. <laughs> The secret is sleeping in the trees.
the secret is sleeping in the trees. And you know, I don't know, um, Chris, if you ever got to see the like VHS art for this. It's like either online or maybe as like a kid in the video store. Because this was one of those films that for the longest time it had VHS release, but then it was out of print for years and years. And I adore, I adore the original VHS art. And it kind of, because to me, it kind of sums up this film is, is such a beast unto itself. Like it's very much like not quite like anything else you see. Yeah. Well, I mean, at, for me. the, at, at the time, I mean, I would mm-hmm. say that there are a lot of things now that owe this a lot of a, a pretty big debt of gratitude. Robert Eggers, the witch, I think, comes to mind. Oh, you mean that? The witch. The witch. Yeah. The witch. Yeah. The bodacious of The bodacious witches. Um. Yeah, no, the uh, the 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 witch I think owes this movie pretty large debt of gratitude in a lot of ways. Uh it's I I have not seen another movie like this one other than The Witch. Uh and I think for me this this movie is weird because it's barely a movie in a lot of ways. Like there there's I would say barely a movie but the plot is so incidental it feels like in a lot of ways and the movie most of the time isn't really interested in explaining the narrative it's more more or less you're just following these people as the story happens so it's kind of an interesting way of telling the story i think obviously having it framed in flashback is obviously something that having read reviews about the movie and my own personal feelings like oh well there are no stakes now because we know the outcome and who is telling the story and answers some some kind of questions out of the gate but I enjoyed this movie for what it is but it is hard for me to like the original cut of the movie a whole lot because it's a mess and it's a mess that they tried to fix in ways that made it worse clearly made it worse like made it so much worse that not only do i think pretty much the general consensus online is watch the original and then watch the the cry blue sky version and i think most people would even contend there's not a reason to watch the original cut anymore because the cry blue sky version is the director's intent right which i kind of you know I really wish that Severin, which created God Bless Severin, because they're the ones that remastered uh, both versions of the right, films. Right. Like we got a we got 4K with Eyes of Fire, and we got a 2K of the of Cry Blue Sky. So I mean, and Severin do beautiful work, anyways. But I I kind of wish that the Cry Blue Sky cut was released on its own as the proper director's cut, because that's really what it is, from what I can. Right. Think. Right. I mean, if you're saying director's intent, that's basically to me it sounds like yeah, the director's cut. And, and yeah, there's really no going back because I, my first experience, like I said, was the theatrical cut, which is like the Eyes of Fire cut. And that floored me. Um, and especially because Krauts, um, for anybody that, you know, a lot of people might not realize this, he, before going into filmmaking, was a very much like respected photographer. Right. And, and, and visual artist. Which, and, like, if you can't tell that by just watching this movie, it's like, oh. I don't know, like, <laughs> It's like Cindy Sherman's office killer. It's that same thing. It's like clearly the person making this movie has an eye for shot composition outside of the film and the the moving picture aspect of the movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, his visual language. And and to me, that's one of the the things, one of the biggest things that makes this film so just um, mesmerizing and unforgettable is um in, in, effect, in fact he even i know like there was later on like an award like a filmmaking award don't know who put it out called the avery Krauts award and it, part of that description of the word is for a film that is more than just telling a story but is is akin to almost like a visual poem and mm-hmm. i think in a lot of ways that makes sense eyes of fire you know or you know cry blue sky either one it's definitely a visual poem but once you but once you see the original cut, and that's why we're launching already into this like hard is because once you see the original cut, it's mind blowing, like how dodgy the choices made in the Eyes of Fire cut really are. I would, and I mean, I won't say that's going to ruin it. Like, I mean, if that's the only cut you can get, I know Eyes of Fire's on Shutter. I mean, you know, please still watch it. You know, there's uh, like so many great things that we're about to go into. We'll go into further detail about individually with the movie. But if you can, cannot emphasize enough because the I'm trying to save myself because I almost immediately want to tirade about the ending. This the ending's the biggest um, oh, yeah. kerfluffle for me. 
But um, but Avery Crown's just like this amazing guy from Paducah, Kentucky. Um, and I think it's important to note that he, you know, he was Southern because this film was shot in Missouri. And that region of Missouri, which is basically like the Ozarks, which is also the region that I live in. I'm from in Arkansas. Which is um, the region that I went to college in out of high school in Columbia. It's like an hour from the Ozarks. So. Which is crazy. Such a small world. But what I but that's what I love about this movie is you can I could I could have told you where it was filmed is what I is what I felt like. Like it just looks like yeah. the Ozarks. Like it doesn't it doesn't look like the Northeast. Like no, but which but, is where it's supposed to be, I guess. Like I guess, right? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, uh, maybe I mean there were settlers. I mean, that's the this region definitely has a lot of person. I think there's well, I don't know. No, it's like, I guess it's supposed to be the frontier, but what does that mean? Like, I. It's a little nebulous. Well, yeah, because <laughs> the, Shaw- the, Shawnee, the Shawnee Indians were Ohio, Illinois, Maryland, mm-hmm. Delaware, Pennsylvania. So, like, I, I don't know. I just assumed it was the Northeast, but yeah, it looked like the Ozarks to me. Oh, it totally. Well, yeah, if you know that, because I remember when I first watched it before I even watched any supplements and knew any of the details, I was like, gosh, this looks familiar, <laughs> this region. But the reason I love that is the Ozarks, it is a gorgeous region for nature, but there is there is legitimately kind of a, a strangeness to me. There's right. a, a vibe, there's an atmosphere. I think at different parts of the of the American South in general, but non-Southern filmmakers, when they try to shoot anything in the South, it's always just ends up being like, you know, somebody squeal like big and, and drink a pip is moonshake. And, you know, right. it's just like, it's automatically the obvious. And um, but the ones, the filmmakers, especially with horror that really get it right, whether it's like Toby Hooper or S.F. Brownrigg and now Avery Crouch, like they nail that, that atmosphere. Like this film, like if you're. The fuzziness if you're, of it all. The, the match, like the beauty, the eeriness. It's, um, like fuzzy, it's like fuzzy. Do you know what I mean? Like there's like, like that weird glow like a, to the like light. Like a haze. Yeah. Almost like a haze. Yeah, yeah. totally. Like, and, which is, which is also a very humid region. <laughs> so it. So yeah, it, it 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 tracks that the the locale alone, and I think the cast, like, because he he does the thing that I my favorite directors always do, which is he casts people that are not only great actors but visually have a presence too. Like right. I find not all actors have a strong visual presence. I know that sounds weird, but I mean, you know, certain actors like I mean, like to be like Brad Pitt doesn't have a strong presence unless he's playing somebody that isn't Brad Pitt, right? And he's forced to do have forced to do that. But some actors naturally just have that and just have a great face that just isn't like anybody else's. Like nobody in this film looks like anybody else. No, and this movie has one of the like few times I've seen Rob Paulson in anything live action. Rob Paulson of like every voice that most people can think of from the 90s in terms of like Animaniacs, mm. Pinky in the Brain. Uh, Jimmy Neutron, like a lot. I mean, he was Raphael in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for me specifically. Oh, but wow. He's like rarely in front of the camera. He's not known as an in front of the camera guy, but yet here he is as a, 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 a American colonialist. And yeah, to your point, like, eh, yeah, sure. Why not? Like, And he's great. Honestly, yeah. I, had no, I had no idea about his background until I started looking up for this. And I was like, holy shit, that's me. Yeah, because he's again, he's like known for being in front of the camera at all. Like this is I think this might be the first time I've ever seen him in anything in front of the camera. Because, I mean, it'd be like Dan Castellaneta. You know, it's like I've seen him in more stuff than I've seen Rob Paulson. Oh, totally. Yeah, because at least he was not married with children. Yeah. And he was in Arrested Development and a couple other things. Rob Paulson, like it was just weird to see him show up Mm because I didn't recognize essentially anybody in this movie, which is always a weird thing, but a, a welcome thing, I guess, for this kind of movie. It kind of helps sell sell it for me. Oh, yeah. Well, and and it's, it's the thing is that there are, like, there are key people in the cast that were very successful, like, character actors. But that's the beauty of a character actor, and especially a really good one, is they can transform in a right. way. And, like, Dennis Lipscomb, who plays um, Smythe. Like Will Smith, who's like this this pat like this preacher character who basically gets run out of a village because he is you know basically living with a married woman right whilst while still being a man of God and so you know they him and you know his his lady his his scarlet lady um 
and her kid, along with some of his followers, end up getting kind of thrown out by all, all kind of the lynch mob. Though I love like the power play where he's basically like, you know, okay, we're going to have to go, but we will have to abscond. I mean, take. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he, like, literally, that's, which is such a great power move. Like, you guys, they tried to hang him, and he has, which I love, the character Leah. He's, yeah. Leah's basically, she's literally, we find out later on, a fairy. Yeah, she's like a wood nymph, right? Like, a, yeah, this beautiful Irish, just redhead. Um, Carleen uh, Carlton is the actress. And what's weird is I looked her up, and she, like, you see pictures of her in other roles. Like, she did a lot of TV. Um, and, it's like you can still like you can still still it's her, but it's strange. It's like whoa, like because you're she's so good, she's right. so great as Leah. I mean, she embodies this character. Um, that Leah saves this pastor from being the hog, and uh, it's so. And he's like his final like fuck you to this village. It's like we're gonna take your goats and your potatoes and your cows and go live in a and go live in a valley that we all know is haunted. Is haunted as hell. It yeah. is like the which which is so which is so great. And nobody and, and that's my problem with like uh, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but I have to do this. I must go with my heart here. With like and I've only seen in various parts of the the witch or the the the, 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 the witch witch is the evil that's that eyes of fire or cry blue sky. Well, either one is dealing with isn't the devil. It's not. It's not rooted in Judeo Christianity. It's basically rooted, in, in effect, in the original cut, especially. I think one could argue that it's the film in some ways is almost anti-religion, right? Or at least right. anti-organized religion. Um, is basically like mankind, like where where you know basically where innocent blood has been spilled. You know, all of that energy basically forms a harmful spirit. Right. And which is such a great metaphor for like basically what humanity's done to this split out. I mean, you could read it as an ecology thing, especially global warming. Right. Uh, you could also just read it. I think it's, it's just, you know, we, we cannot, we cannot truly escape the sins of our fathers in, in this life. And it is, I mean, when I say that, I don't mean like our, I don't even mean it as a gender thing. I don't mean it as a familial thing necessarily, but just, you know, all the fucked up shit that happens in history and planet, it's there. That's a stain. And if we don't learn from it, you know, all of that blood adds up, you know, and it just kind of continues. Yeah, except in, in real life, it's not like an evil forest spirit. It's just like people becoming the problem yet again. And right. You, you know, and, and whatever. I mean, that's a cheery topic. But um, but that's such a cool thing. And I, I appreciate that because it's like, I I don't know. I mean, Chris, have you, you've seen The Witch, right? Yeah. Is it is the whole thing basically be like you know? But what is the moral tale? How would you describe? I I would describe the that is like that. There's an the witch ends up being about the otherness of people, and the 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 female character is being claimed as a witch because of the way that she acts. So it's again the story of like the other is being kind of castigated by the group and then being forced out, and then at the end of the movie the character who was not a witch gives in to the witches and becomes a witch at the end. So it's like, I don't know what the moral of the story is essentially just like never stop being yourself because society will do its best to, to show. And again, like isolate the others. And that's kind of what the witch ends up being about is like this family gets put out of the group. And then this girl in the family gets put out of the family because they think that she's a witch with or without proof. So this movie's message is a little different. I think this me this movie's message is a little bit more timely and a little less mm, explained outright. I wish I this appreciate. Movie does, yeah, this movie doesn't explain mo much of anything. But that's okay. Like, yeah, hey, yeah, I like, like that. It, it it lets you know it lets you know what the kind of framework of the world is in terms of how the thing that they're going to interact with later in the movie more or less came into being. That's mm -hmm. what the movie tells you. But other than that, the movie doesn't say much about what the practical effect roaming the woods is. Yeah. Oh, but, I, but I love that. Because to me, like with horror, I think horror is always its best when it's a little, like it's a little more like, hey, yeah, we talk about the haze. You know, it's a little more hazy because personally, the unknown is always going to be the most scary. Right. In a lot of ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, to me, that's kind of true to life because who has all the answers in real life? 
for anything. You know, like anybody that tells you they have all the answers to anything, especially if they're in a position of power. Yeah. But just in general, don't watch your back because they're, you know, they're going to be probably a charlatan at worst and at best misguided. But uh, so I, I personally, I love that. I always, I, I don't, I also think it's like respectful to the audience. Like if you try, if you explain everything to your audience, you're treating them like the, like they're dumb children, not even like smart children, you know, right, like you're, right. and I mean, cause kids are smart. Like just don't, you know, give people the benefit of it. And right. if, and it's not, if somebody wants everything explained to them, that's fine. But, you know, go, go. But I don't think most people are that stupid. You know, like, I'm not so cynical. I, I'm sure there's a handful of people that do really just want things overly simplified. And that's fine, too. Like, to each his, his or her own. But, like, I, I love that. And it is like a, like, it, like, it is like a poem. This whole thing is sort of like a surrealistic tone poem in places. And I, and I, and I love that it's not explained. Yeah, you know, there's something very... I don't know. Something, it, it, it's truly a magical movie in the sense of like, and I hate it because now when people say magical, that word gets overused. But I mean, in the sense of just like, there is sort of like when you go on an, on a walk and you see something, nature itself is magic, you know? Cause the, I mean, just look at, look at the way like certain insects look. They, you know, they, they're beautiful and they're otherworldly looking to us. I'm sure we look like total monsters, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, and, that, and the film captures, that. like, whether it's, you know, the nature scene, scenes, like, there's a really beautiful shot of a dragonfly at one point, like, that's, you know, or even just the way the flowers are presented, the way the sky is presented, to, you know, when we do see, like, the the main, like, sort of evil spirit of this cursed land, which is intense, and the way that it moves. Like it wriggles out of the ground. It's it's like I and I mean it's a I mean it's probably a simple effect, but the way it's done, it it makes me think of like like when you see like the way people move in like the original Japanese ring because yeah, that's yeah, yeah. not like that wasn't an effect that was like a dancer that just was able to contort their body a certain but that because of that it looks more crazy and fucked up after like right, holy right. Shit. like what is that. Um, the the physicality I just think is well and what's and what's interesting is again it's a it's an interesting design I think the creature is an interesting design and for what the movie needs it to be I don't think it I don't know for what the movie needed it to be I don't think it is any more or any less like I think it's fine mm-hmm. you know what I mean like and I think it I think what's funny is in the original cut of the movie. God, they overuse it. And like, it's what's wild to me is like when they overuse it, the it's really easy to tell the quality of it. But when it's used more sparingly, like in the director's cut, I think it works better because it's like it's like the shark in Jaws. Like, I don't if I see it constantly, it's going to just start to look cheap. But when you when you're lighting it a certain way, when you're focusing on other things in the scene and not it. I think it works better than, and again, I think that's because the original cut of the movie is just in 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 every single way an inferior film, and yeah. not not worth. I mean, again, only worth watching if you're a completionist. But nothing about the original cut of the movie is better than the director's cut because the director's cut actually understands how to use those supernatural elements that the movie introduces, and the original movie just overdoes it, just overdoes it constantly. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it it's. It's uh, like to quote uh, to quote Henry uh, Chinaski, obviousness. It's, it's yeah, and uh, yeah, and especially I mean, gosh, because that's the thing that fried my brain. Going back to the theatrical cut after watching the director's cut was just it's almost like it's like it, it'd be like going back to dial up after you after you right. after you've cable load over something. It's like you're like oh no, like why you know because it's. Because you know the beauty and you know the full power of it, so to see it tampered with just seems um, seems a little obscene. And I mean, granted, I'll say this objectively: I, is is it the worst case of studio tampering I've seen in a movie? No, no, far from it, far from it. Because it's still it the strengths are still there. And again, like to anybody listening that's curious to watch it, if the only if your most easily readable accessible copy is the main one, please still watch it because there's still like crowns who we just lost earlier this year um such a powerful artist and and plus the performances i think especially carlene carlton but also dennis lipscomb as will Smythe, which i oh my gosh i love his Smythe. i'll get into that in a second but um i mean do still watch it but 
Uh, but only if that's the only one you have easily accessible. Otherwise, yeah, and honestly, I think, I mean, it's a bonus feature. The, the, the director's cut is on the Severin disc. Like whether right. you get it solo or in the the full um the uh the full core box, so you know what you guys got to do. Come on, you want the sweet stuff. You want the director's cut, as as we all should with anything. But um, but yeah, no, with with the original cut, like it's it's so it's so much more intelligent the way like both the supernaturals approach, but also the framing. Because even though like the voiceovers throughout in both cuts. In the original, like the theatrical cut, I mean, like it doesn't, we don't have the preamble in the beginning. It's just straight into the story. Right. And it's not even, we don't even, it's not even fully revealed like where Fanny and two of the other girls are at until the very end. Like they do, there is still like some mystery, but also they completely, oh my God, this, this hurts my brain so much, but they did it redoing it. Cause like in the, in the theatrical cut, they're talking to like these French, Sort of colonial. How you say in the valley, the haunted valley, like the fakiest French people. It, like, it, how you say it? It, it, is, it is more subtle than John Cleese and Holy Grail, but not by much. I'm surprised they didn't call my outrageous for Jackson. <laughs> yeah. You know? Tell me what what is this haunted valley you speak of? Yeah. And yeah, but then that no, like, what the fuck is this? Like, yeah, was was the actor told French asshole? Go for French asshole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, it's it it like the moment that character showed up on screen, I was like, well, is this supposed to be a joke? Like, the accent is such a put on. Oh, and 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 the worst part now is the the, the and, and I hate this shit. I hate it when movies do this because it was a trope even in the eighties, and now it's like beyond the. Tropius of tropes, but you know, the soldier, the little guardsman comes up to escort the girls and he steps into a key light that hits his eyes and he's got the devil yellow <laughs> evil's forest spirit. <laughs> and that's how it ends. And I'm like, really? Like this is that worked one time, didn't it? In thriller, and that was it. Oh my god, it way better in thriller. Mm, and because the, honestly it's the thriller eyes isn't it like that's what i thought that was that in the original cut of the movie the theatrical cut of the movie hits literally thriller eyes it does make you think of thriller what cry blue sky does that yeah but, but again like you point out it's because it's used so sparingly but we also never see it on a human person right right which makes all the difference in the little cry blue sky version it still shows the little kid with the yeah eyes. but the little kid's got the fucked up face with the eyes. Like, it's yeah. not normal. Those, that eye effect does not look good. It's, I don't know. It, it freaks me out. Yeah, we like, saw an effect similar in Twilight Zone 1985 in an episode segment. And I think it works better here, but it only works better here because it's not focused on as long. It's, it's used sparingly, but just enough to be free to be like, what the? Yeah, it's not the right, 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 like, right, ah. right. Whereas, like, yeah, that ending, it's seeing the, the original ending where, where Krabs had was so so much better because they're talking to a priest and the and the room that they're talking to like they're they're telling the story of this priest almost looks like a set out of um ken russell's the devils yeah like a derek jarman set where it's bone white like angles and yet he and the girls are all in like almost like especially the priest is in like the blackest of robes like this is the goth robe like you could buy this priest robe on killstar or vampire, you know, freaks or something. It is so goth. And and there's no like, oh, it's the devil. You know, it's nothing like that. Like it's it's just like it's a little more, it's a lot more open-ended. And and it's all the better for it because it matches the movie better. It's just and also it's more it's it's just smarter. It's not like, oh, look, it's a devil guard, you know, like, uh what I didn't understand. So in the original cut of the movie, the family goes to the valley. Essentially, mm-hmm. everybody dies except for, you know, the the sister and the kids. And then they make their way to this French encampment. And then they tell the Frenchman their story. And then they're led off by a person possessed by Leah, who is not a villain in the movie. But yet the ending is played like she's a villain because isn't the isn't she a good witch? Isn't she well, the one? And like, like, that's the thing, like, because then the cry blue sky version essentially is like, yeah, that's what is going on here. She's not. 
a a a antagonist at all at the end she is protecting them that's more or less made clear but in the original cut of the, or the theatrical cut of the movie it's like it's like it doesn't even understand the story it told up into that point like she was never antagonistic it was just misunderstood but yet at the end of the movie when they play the thriller scene it's like that's meant <laughs> to be antagonistic is it not like is that not the point of having him be yellow-eyed because the only other time we've seen anyone yellow-eyed is the tree creature but mm -hmm. we know that the tree creature's power was passed on to her at the end of the theatrical cut we see that with her eating the frog so it's just very strange because like she's not a villain so what are you doing movie are you confused well you know what's interesting because i my read of that was that leah was still a guardian because like the little girl gets a flower and they show her face Leah's face in the fire with the little girl and the little girl's like, oh, we're not alone. We have Leah. And then you see the guards with the eyes. And to me, oh, the just, guard is the devil. That's the not guard her. is the devil. It's like a like it's almost like uh, sequel. Bait. It's very sequel. It's but even I, worse than I know. But I think the fact that there was confusion is just further testament that this was this was a half ass ending. It was not the original vision. Terrible. Yeah. And it's and it's such a. And it's so disappointing because the movie's so good. Like, this is a great movie. And the original cut is great. Like, the original cut is so good. And, like, and it's so they have, like, this half-ass sequel bait, like, jump scare on something that is so poetic and intelligent and lovely. Just feels like, it's like drawing, like, drawing a dog on a plot of, you know, a painting by uh, Paul Clay or something. You know, it's, like that, it's, it's like that scene in the Bean movie <laughs> where he paints the face on the painting of Whistler's mother. And it's like Whistler's mother with then like a fucking like giant nosed cartoon character. And what are what are you doing? Well, yeah. the crazy the crazy thing ultimately is this is an art house movie. This is <laughs> barely even an ho a horror movie. I wouldn't even classify it as a horror. It is a folk movie with horror elements. Mm -hmm. The the actual cut of the movie, the actual cut of the movie has a less horror stuff than the original does however for whatever reason the theatrical cut tries to make it into this like actual horror movie of, of the 83 variety and it 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 really is just like a complete misunderstanding of what avery Crouch was trying to do and i can't imagine being him for as long as he he, he lived having to mm -hmm. deal with the movie being as bad as it was knowing what i intended this to be because yeah. it is a fucking far cry it's this isn't some ridley scott well deckard is a fucking you know is a fucking replicant shit that's not this this is literally the movie is being changed so substantively that it is a completely different movie yes they used it they use the same scenes and a lot of the same footage is there but the way that it's used and the way that it's cut and all of the surrounding things that hold it in place are so much firmer than they are in the theatrical cut, which feels very shaky in terms of what the theme of the movie is. Yeah. Well, and it also, to me, weakens the whole, like, because one of the things that I find really fascinating is is how anti, you know, and I mean, whether or not this was a strong intention, and I would gather yes, but I could see, you know, we, we, we don't have Avery Crouch with us, obviously, to ask, but but that that whole feeling is kind of weakened in the eyes of fire cut um, because in the original cut, like you have, you know, figures of Will Smythe who, you know, is kind of a shit. He's a little he's arrogant, uh, but he has good traits. And that's the other thing actually I really love about this movie real quick is that well, I don't think there's any real human villains. I mean, I think the lynch mob are pretty fucking close, but. They're still people like everybody's a person in this universe. Some, some are better than others. But again, that to me, that's like that's true to life. Like very few people in life I mean, are 100 percent one way or the other. You know, we're, right. we all we all have shades of gray somewhere. <laughs> but um, and I and to me, Dennis Lipscomb, especially in this film, like I love his performance of Smythe because he does have that mix like he portrays it so well but also he has such a great face like to me he looks like more so maybe than anybody else to cast like he could be from a silent movie like he's got right. that kind of like silent film actor face that's just like kind of kind of beautiful and a little strange and like every time he's on screen like i don't know crowds obviously i think recognizes that because i think smile i think in some ways the two characters that are shot 
you know, are filled to the best and to the most ability is him and Leia. Or Leia, even. This is Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you were going to say Fran Ryan, who has like one of the funniest lines in the movie, where she's just like crowing is the... Oh my yeah. gosh. I'm if, I, like, oh. I know, but she... Oh, she's a lot in killing I, character I actors. Because I... I just, such a strange line reading that I, I, I can't believe it actually made it into both cuts of the movie. Uh, uh, <laughs> she's, she's, oh, I, it was because the first time I saw this, I kept being like, where do I know her from? And then I looked at her IMDb and I was like, oh, God, yeah, everything. Right. Everything. Like pro- for me, probably growing up watching Night Court because she was on a few episodes of Night Court, but she's like been in every like great uh, character actress, but but I feel like like both Carlene Carlton's like face because she doesn't really look like anybody else either. Like mm-hmm. nobody in this cast really does, but she especially and Dennis Lipscomb, like you know, yeah. and and that whole pairing is fascinating mm-hmm. too of just the characters because Smythe is like you know, rescued this little sort of wild you know like Irish girl whose mother was burned to death, and, right. and Leia Leia isn't. Yeah, nobody calls her a, a, a witch until like towards the end. But she's got like obviously like kind of displays certain powers very early on. I mean, she saves his life. And but what's kind of cute is she's never she's always shown and it's like the sort of like innocent like just she is like this innocent spirit. Like the way she interacts right. with the kids, um, how protective she is, just her physicality. Like at one point, and it's such a little shot, but it's so silly. But it always makes me laugh when she like shot, like she kind of like lurches out of the water naked and scares um the uh, who ends up being you know the actual father of the the daughter that's narrating it, the one right. who's white, his who's white. It's of wording with smile, Marion, played by Guy Boyd, um, and she scares him, but even he starts laughing because it's so silly, like and, um. And he's a really, God, I didn't even mention him until now. He's, I think he's really great as Mary. He's got that great kind of rugged character actor, like stoic, masculine man. And you it's, do, the, like, it's the eyes. It's the eyes. It's the beard. It's, um, you do, I do love the fact that like he could speak a little bit of Shawnee and he's protective of the Indians. Like, right. I, that, that's one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie yeah. is that, is that scene. Because again, like it's, we're given very little context while it's happening as to what's going on. And you learn about it after the fact. But it's such an I mean, the, the way it's shot, what he's doing with that, like, get up with the branches on top of his head, like, and then that the French, those French dudes just get murdered is is all. I mean, it's fantastic. I just I think that's probably my favorite scene in the entire. Movie. Oh, it's so good. Well, especially because he, you know, he's he's got the, the Indians laughing and Jules here, I believe is Paulson's character asks, like, why were they, you know, what were they laughing at? And it's like, you know, oh, they asked me about where about my wife. So I told them the truth. And then he kind of looks at her and smiles. <laughs> so I love that the character that is doing the extramarital cavorting is you know the the pastor as it were yeah because again like i wonder at least for you like what what is what is the point of the character in the movie what is the point of his character in the because if if you the way i look at this movie is like avery krauts is trying to make several points with this movie or at least kind of open a discussion and like what does it say that he's a man of the cloth who's effectively rejected part of that he well because we never find out what's he's a part of like he's very educated and in fact right. a detail that is believe missing in eyes of fire but in the cry blue sky jules because that's the thing jules is very loyal to to smythe yeah and when marion's trying to ask him jules basically you know you find out smythe taught him how to read right yeah you know, he taught him you know how to read and taught him about like you know astronomy a little bit and you know, and that's the thing, like, Smythe isn't necessarily a big villain. And I also love the fact that the wife isn't really, they don't go for an extra moral approach towards her either. It's not like, oh, how dare she? It's like she she says something to Marion about just like he was too gruff and he wasn't there. Right. But he wasn't. And, and he kinda, wasn't there at the beginning of the movie. I mean, you don't yeah. see, she's not there until like, you know, a quarter of the way into the movie, really. Yeah. Like, and, and it's not making excuses for anything. But again, it's like, these are humans. Yeah. You know? And these are also like extra hard circumstances i mean these are people trying to start a new life in a in a foreign land you know and that's you have to take that to account either and with my 
So I don't know with the whole thing. What what I find the film seems to be more damning of him, and this is maybe just my take, is his arrogance. Right. And it because it's like more and more and he seems to slip more and more because initially it's kind of like, okay, you know, he's a little full of himself, but he seems like you know, he's teaching people how to read. He's lazy, he's, right? He's oh, he's very lazy. Like he, like the like the women are doing, you know, like his lover or you know, pseudo wife, I guess. It's like she's kind of like like having to dig and till the soil and all this while he's just like there being like, oh, it's God's land. Bares each scene. Yeah, and so yeah, he's lazy. He's arrogant. Anything that happens that he's like, oh, this is you know, like. This is God. I didn't see. I bright. And it's like it, when things are clearly going to shit, he is in disbelief. Like his ego is so tied to spirituality. But not even to real spirituality. It's tied to being right. It's tied right. to just good old human folly and arrogant. And to me, I think that's where like the criticism of organized religion comes. Like I feel like the extramarital stuff's almost like just like almost an, not, a, not an afterthought, but I feel like the real thing that damns him is his hubris i th- i mean i i would also say it, it it also cuts to the idea of the hypocrisy of people in religion saying mm. one thing and doing another oh because totally. i'm not sure what i'm not sure what sect of religion would have approved of what he's doing at the time none sect of religion i would the, assume the church of that booty yeah i mean because that's <laughs> a thing well well that's a, i mean to be fair though isn't the joke that all the sexually repressed people came over to this country. Like that was the whole point. Oh yeah, we got all the extremists. That the, yeah, I mean all the Protestants, the, right? All the like, Puritans. We got all the Puritans. Yeah, we're so, even more repressed than the than the Catholics. Yeah, so um, I mean that's and like these people are that. So like in a lot of ways, like and that's what I'm. It's like I think there's also a, a like a, a condemnation of the hypocrisy of you know the saying of one thing and doing another. Because, you know, in 83, I mean, that was going on in the church, obviously. Oh, fuck. Has been forever, so. Oh, my God. No, I love that point, Chris. Holy shit. No, you just tapped into something. Because think about it, like Reagan era, that's when we're dealing with, I mean, not that anything's really changed, obviously, which is depressing. Like, nothing's changed. But but that's where you really did get the, the huge prominence of the huge extreme conservatism and especially tied to televangelism. And, you know, Protestant, mostly Baptist <laughs> religion. And, right. Um, oh, that's, God, that's brilliant, dude. I love that. And especially because the, the, the original cut, the figure we get as a priest, um, who's just sort of just like not really helpful. Like he's not, and again, it's not like, and it's same with, neither one of these guys are like the fucking devil or anything. They're still men. Like, yeah, right. right. But at the same time, you know, because of that, because of them being attached to these these things, they're riddled with a lot of issues and a lot of just, um, you know, arrogance. Because it's like, well, I know God's way. Well, how do you know? How do you know? God you brought know this I mean? little Indian girl to be so yeah. that we could bring her to God. Yeah. And meanwhile, he doesn't listen and doesn't even pay attention to Leah, who's clearly spooked. It's like, okay, the woman who literally has magical powers and saved your aunt, when you're about to be hauling, you're not going to listen to her? But it's like, oh, no, this is this is God. It's like, she has a better line to God than you do. Okay. <laughs> like, come on. And I will say, in, in terms of the, the character destinations or where they end up in the, mm-hmm. in the, in the theatrical cut, it's, I don't know, I found the last act of the theatrical cut to be a rough watch a, a, a i mean it's it's nonsensical in terms of what they're going for i think the cry blue sky version works better but i think it it's they're still having to put a certain puzzle together they're just trying to put it together in a better way but i don't think i think the third act of this movie is still kind of hit or miss in certain spots and a lot more misses than hits frankly oh wow see i well, whoa, whoa. Why just, what? I, I have, a, I just, I just don't think that they have a good resolution for the characters because it seems even when they give it more time, it still seems a little rushed for the amount of time we spent with these characters. Like the character mm-hmm. of Marion, the way his character's story is, is kind of settled and handled is very odd. Is it not? Yeah, it, it is, but I guess he's the main character of the movie, right? Like, I guess, like maybe. Kind of. I mean, half. I mean, in a way, I don't think 
I mean, ultimately, I guess maybe Fanny is really the main character because she's our narrator. Right. And she, which I feel bad for not even mentioning uh, Sally Klein, that actress. And she's great. Honestly, she's great and very likable. And like, this is a rare film where I don't mind kids. In a right. Movie. Yeah, I'm, I'm the, with you. I'm with you. Yeah. All the, all the, all the kids. Um, of course, she's on the older end because she's probably like late teens. But um, she's great. The little, the little girls are great. Like, this is, and usually like putting kids in a movie, I'm, I'm like, oh, okay. It's going to end up being like a Kenny thing, like in Gamera. Like nobody wants to be a Kenny. I don't right. want to see a Kenny. Uh, um, unless Gamera's going to eat them. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Which would be amazing. But um, yeah, when you say that, do you mean the, with just the fact that like, we don't really find out what happens to Miriam? It's like, it's after. just the way it's just the way that it's handled is so strange. It's like they tried to cut around the way that they did it in the theatrical cut and they kind of just cut so much out that it's hard to tell what happened. Oh, in the theatrical cut, yes. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And and also, you know, in the theatrical cut, they put in little extra effects yeah. too. Cause like even like the scene where like they um when they're on like the little like fairy. And they get attacked by the Indians. Right. Like, first of all, they cut it. There's a different cut to make it look like Leah has a like enough of a premonition of Calvin, who's like the elder gentleman, uh, getting getting killed by an arrow, but which you don't see her having that premonition in Cry Blue Sky. Right. And it makes sense why she doesn't, because in the Eyes of Fire cut, she has it right before, literally right before it happens. So it's like it's like a premonition that does nobody. <laughs> I think what does it matter at all? Right. But then, like, when she kind of fans out her dress to protect the rest of the family, they put this, like, weird kind of blur effect in the Eyes of Fire coat, which you don't see in Cry Blue Sky. And I kind of, I prefer it not having that extra effect. It's like, we get it. You know, we're not stupid. We don't need the extra, like, you know, wubba wubba. Right. To quote downtown Julie Brown on that. And as far as, like, I guess I was okay with the, like, the ad, not theatrical, but with Cry Blue Sky as far as the ending. But because to me, I, certain elements just, you know, like with her eating the frog and then like we see kind of the spirits freed. Right. Um, it's, it's like, it's, it's like, which this is full core. So it makes sense, but it's very okay. fairy tale. It's very right. fairy tale. But also what, just, what are, leads to things not being explained. Exactly. Well, everything, even like a lot of religious parables. I mean, there are things, all religions that don't, don't really make sense unless you're the believer. Right. I exactly. mean, or even, or even if you are like, I don't, I, I remember being a little kid and one of my relatives who, uh, what, wasn't the warmest or, you know, non toxic person in the world, very religious. But even they were like mentioning there's like a section of the Bible that talks about giants. Even they were like, what does that mean? Like, what? Do, I mean, sorry, like, you know what I mean? It's like Lit it's like li like literally question mark like literal giants. But um, it's it, it's I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. It's just you know it's why well, it's good not to take everything literally. Maybe <laughs> you know it's parables for reasons, I guess. But right. Uh, I, I I just I loved sort of the whimsy of it. I mean, could it have been longer? Actually, yeah, I, but I wouldn't have bided that because to me, I love the movie. It's like, no, I, I would have preferred yeah. there a little bit more just to give again, because I think for me, there's no point in watching the original cut of the movie or the theatrical cut, the version that everybody saw when it came. I don't think there's a point in watching it, but I do wish that there was even more to this director's cut because there clearly are a lot of ideas here that could have been further expounded. Oh, agreed. I'm glad we live in a, u a universe and a reality where this ends up happening, where we end up getting this director's cut of the movie 20 plus years on. Oh, goodness. Well, and think about the great timing of it, especially with us just, you know, with Avery Krauts passing away this year. You know, again, thank goodness for Severin for being right. able to contact him and to have access to that. Because that was his print. That wasn't like, like, if they hadn't made that line to him, we wouldn't have that. Right. And, exactly. And that's always kind of a scary thing with film is especially once artists die it's like sometimes you know things are left in the states that the estates don't care and so certain right. things never do surface or they're just left to kind of languish i mean like i know we're we're famously having that problem with russ meyer and his prints because of, you know the people that currently own the rights to it don't barely don't give a shit about restorations you know and preservation so so, so when stuff like this, when something does happen that's actually positive, this field, like companies like Severin and Eero and Federer Syndrome and so many others, um, it, it's 
you know, it's good to see because, gosh, this film, this was a film that for the longest time you could only see as like a, a, from a VHS rip on YouTube that was like not the greatest VHS rip either. Like right. it was not, it was not good. Um, it was kind of have the devils. Oh my God. Yeah. Same switch. deal, right? Like there's two cuts of the devils, right? Yeah. Well, and another one where it's like, of course, that one's even more anti organized religion than this. I, sure is. But I, uh, and, Ken, Ru- I'm sorry. Every every Ken Russell movie should be preserved, restored, and available to the public. Ken Russell, that to get as much as I preach about religion, art is my religion. I'm like Ken Russell's the auteur, and his stuff should be like it's it's it is the real obscenity is that like this this is a film that's several decades old, and you know we don't have like I mean I do have a pseudo director's cut that I bought on the gray market. <laughs> That all of the Amazon that I'm sure everybody could get that's a pretty good that's I mean the price really good but it's like it needs to be restored properly right. come on what the fuck this is this is this is bullshit it's 2023 before well, the world the burns down completely let us have some respect to our artists <laughs> well and that's the thing I mean you know it is it is nice that we have this opportunity to watch this version of the movie because I can completely understand why this movie fell as flat as it did for so many people with that theatrical cut i mean the the reviews at the time were like it's a nice looking movie but like it's not i don't know i feel like people were left wanting and i was not as i was not left as wanting by the cry blue sky version but i don't think the cry blue sky version is a horror movie the way that eyes of fire is but i think because eyes of fire is a horror movie it does what they did actually shoot and should have had put together for a theatrical cut it doesn't do it justice, but it's not a horror movie the way that Eyes of Fire is more or less made to be. You know what I mean? I think it's made, it's definitely made to be more obvious horror movie. I right. Think, That's why I, I mean, would, obvious. Yeah. Like for, for the obvious, Friday yeah. night. Yeah, for the Friday night masses. Like, you know, when I say horror movie, that's what I mean. Like, this is like the expectation was we're going to put it out on a Friday night and get people in the door. But like that, that was never going to be the case with this movie, no matter how hard you try. Yeah. I definitely, and I mean, just sort of, and sadly, this is a tale as old as time, as far as, as long as cinema's practically fit a form, is that, you know, you get something that's truly worthwhile and special, but it's, it's left in the hands of money men and people that are like, oh, it's too long. And that's it. I guess that was one of the complaints too, is that the original cut was too long. You and I have, that, how long is the, is Cry Blue Sky? Like, it's not even two hours. 20 minutes longer. Yeah, and now people are like, you know, they're like Spider-Man's like, you know, a fucking Fassbender movie as far as length goes. Right. But not quality, sadly, because I love Fassbender. Fassbender. No, Fassbender. Fassbender. But now, um, and, and if you read the article, and there's an article from like 83 or 86 that, that talks to Avery Crowns, and he just goes, we changed the ending because the, the reaction in the theaters was so negative. And it was the original ending was ambiguous. Like, oh, the ambiguousness of what? Like, again, like nothing in this movie seems in like seems like it wasn't intentional. So, yes, maybe it's ambiguous, but I don't think it's really that ambiguous. No, but also I think the actual fucking theatrical cuts ending is more ambiguous than the Cry Blue Sky version. Wouldn't you say like what the actual Cry Blue Sky ending makes sense, more sense in terms of the. The full narrative, the full story, the entire story makes more sense from start yeah. to finish. Well, and, they, and it also like the Ice of Fire ending, to me, it kind of hurts one of the film's biggest powers is that it takes something where it's clearly you have a clear like the evil is in the in this forest. And it's because of just all of the bloodshed that's been unnecessary. And especially, I mean, I think it's almost, it's a, it's a slight undercurrent, but it's probably also a lot of how many Indians, because even Mirian at one point says this was their land, right. were the intruders, you know, of how many Indians needlessly died. I mean, that was, that's a genocide that this country has to, that still doesn't really fully acknowledge like it should. And, you know, and then on top of that, you've got settlers who a lot of whom were innocent, just trying to make their lives and getting killed too. And it's just like this, you know, but you have that clear evil of just like, this is what we do to each other as a species. And that's awful and it's not needed and it's pain and it's hurt. And you take that, you take that message and all of a sudden just make it, oh, wait, sight, it's the fucking devil. (laughs) Right. 
And, right. and, and it's so a, go- it's so a goopy, dumb. a goopy devil monster. It's yeah. so dumb, and especially on a movie that you know you nailed it with art house because this is art. This movie is a hundred percent art, and it's Avery Krauss is a genius. This this is like so many of the ways, like his visualization, his language is so. And this was his first film too, like which is easy because oh. it's so. I mean. Right. Talk about like hit the ground running. It's so it, it's it's such a special work. And I, and I think it's a testament to his genius that even this like, kind of dodgy theatrical cut that was the VHS cut, this film had a cult following for years where people were like, is this ever going to get a release? And that's how you know something's good is even even despite some of the extra flaws added to people, you know, people wanted wanted it to get the proper love and restoration it deserved. And thankfully it has. We, we can't say that about every movie, unfortunately. There's just not a lot of stuff like this movie, even still. Mm. Like, and, and I don't know, like when I think about the other kinds of movies like this one, like I said, it's a short list. And I, again, like I would say that this is up at the top of the list of things on that list worth watching. Because this, I think, is better than most contemporary kinds of movies like this, including The Witch. Only because, again, The Witch's theme is just, it's a little on the nose for me. Like, it's a little mm. on the nose. And, you know, it's the you know it's not a trauma monster, thank God, which is now, like, the, everybody's most popular fucking thing is everything's a trauma monster. Or every monster is trauma in monster form. Looking at you, every Babadook. No, no one can no one can save you. Like, I mean, a lot of these movies, like even Talk Talk to Me is a trauma monster movie, but I think it's the best of those trauma monster movies. Um, I'm so sick of those that seeing something like this that's not that is also so refreshing that I was like, damn, I'm on board with this because it's just something different, anyways. Exactly. No, God, that was I feel like slip of my finger, but that was that brilliantly put. And that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, even though, yeah, 80. You know, this came out in 83. This isn't, there's something about this that feels like an 80s movie. Like, it just no. is, it is truly, I think, kind of like what I was saying in the beginning, like, it is its own thing. Because even things that might kind of take, that took some inspiration from it, they're not like it. Because even, like, what I've seen of The Witch, it looks like it's very muted visually, mm-hmm. like the tones. It's something that I appreciate so much about Krauts is that there's so much color here. I mean, it's not obviously not like Suspiria. It's not like, you know, Argento color, but it's the color of nature. And even when it's something that's a little more earth toned, he really knows how to shoot like earth tones in a way where you see texture and you see, you know, like where it, it, it's got so much layers to it. It's not just, you know, it just everything looks visually dynamic. And I, I kind of, I don't like it when horror movies, especially set in nature, look flat. Because to me, like, film is a visual medium, so you should really take advantage of it. Unless the intent is to not take advantage of it. Which is, why? Which is fine, yeah. Why? Why do that? Don't like, ask me. Want? I mean, again, like, there, I get it <laughs> in theory, but I think in execution, it leaves a lot to be desired. It looks, it's, unless somebody, and I'm sure maybe, I don't know. It's it's just always to me it's going to be at risk of coming across as really lazy if somebody's not trying at least a little bit you know as far as the visual. Uh, also, another thing that's really great um, that's it's more understated, but I really love the score, like the music. Yes. Brad Friedel. I couldn't believe it was Brad Friedel. I was like Brad Friedel from Fright Night. Like the guy into the score for Fright Night, and also I found out Terminator One and Two. As well as everybody's favorite overtly anti-Muslim Schwarzenegger film, True Lies. I, I, you know, honestly, I didn't know some. I like that movie, but it is hard for me to deal with the anti-Muslimness of that movie. And also Tia Carrera, like why anybody ever thought she needed to be in a movie for more than one scene is always going to be a question that I will never have an answer for. Hey, so, hey, she's good as Cassandra. Wayne's World. I love Wayne's World. <laughs> I do love it. Sure, sure. I like Wayne's World. I always forget that she's in it. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm. You know why? You're blinded. You're blinded by Rob Lowe. You're blinded by by my beloved Dana Carvey as guard saying, you know, if Benjamin was was his favorite ice cream flavor is pralines and dip. <laughs> I do love Dana Carvey. I think I, I, I think so there's always room for the there's always room for Dana Carvey at the table. A hundred. Uh, it's 20%. Uh, but no, Final, like, 
And this score is unlike anything I've heard of his. Like, he's the, he's a really good, I feel like a little bit, I mean, it's weird to say this, but somebody who's obviously successful, but I don't ever hear his name really mentioned. A whole lot of people talk about film composers. And I think he's great. I loved his instrumental work in Fright Night. Um, not to be confused with the Jay Giles band, Fright Night. That's also <laughs> Who doesn't love some Jay Giles band? Am I right? I do. I don't. I wouldn't use that song as an example of some of their finest. There's only, there's only one song worth talking about. Is it, are, is it Centerfold? Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> Did you hear about people that misheard lyric of that, or somebody thought it was my anus is the center hole? <laughs> oh man. My blood runs cold. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think my favorite is still Hold Me Closer, Tony Danza. Oh. That's still my favorite. That's so wholesome. It's the most wholesome, Tony Danza. Who wouldn't want to be held close by Tony Danza? Mona. I can't do it. I can't do it. Oh, I mean, he's a, he's like, uh, you know, he has, a, he has a musical career too, Mr. Danza does. Oh my God, is that legit? That's real, yeah. You guys should cover it on Noise Junkies. I know, we should podcast. have done that. We should do a part Instead two. of clowning on Joe Pesci, you could have talked about, hey, Tony Danza. I, did I clown on Joe Pesci? Danzing on Danza. You know I did not clown on huh? Pesci. He deserved to be clowned on with how terrible his music is. Oh my gosh. Tony, okay, duly noted, by the way, for a future episode. Tony Danza. Yeah. Uh, no, what's funny is you mentioned Brad Fidel, I, I think, you know, when I think about Terminator, I always kind of attribute the theme song of Terminator to James Cameron, which is weird. But James Cameron had a part in making it. So I always forget that there was someone else involved because I just assume James Cameron is a psychopath when it comes to controlling everything, which seems to be the case. But I like the score of this movie a lot. Again, it's it's exactly what it needs to be. Exactly. And it's also like it's dialed down what it needs to be, too. Like right. It's very expertly crafted and, and used and um and again that's another thing you're talking about like more, more modern horror i and i've i've probably read about this before in other other shows but um sound people like sound design and especially music when it's used yeah. right that is that that just hammers the feel of everything so much more and i think that really does does like the, the case here so i mean yeah i agree i i you know i'm I'm glad that I'm glad that we watched this movie because, again, I'm a huge fan of these kinds of things that like, oh, it was just like there's another version and there's two more versions. And, you know, we did uh, the Blair Witch sequel, I think, last year, the year before. And that was similar to this. And like there's an original cut and then there's like the Berlinger cut and the Berlinger cut makes it a good movie actually worth watching. But. Again, in that respect, you can't really suggest that movie because that's a fan edit that never had an official release. I mean, again, un unless you want to rail against me saying that that's not official, but it's not because it never got released on Blu-ray in an official way, which means not everybody has access to it. I mm -hmm. would say now that you can go and buy this version of the movie, why would you watch or buy anything else? And on the major torrent website that has the torrent for this movie, I won't say where, I won't say what website, the version that they have is the Cry Blue Sky version. Not that we're endorsing this thing. Chris is just saying. I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, just uh, saying. Allegedly. If you like this, go and buy it. But yes. if you want to watch it to see if you like it, there are ways to go about doing that. And you can watch it on Shudder. It is on Shudder. The theatrical version yeah, is on which, Shudder. Which is the problem. Yeah, that's... I love that. But if you, there's nothing wrong with informing yourself as a consumer, especially because Blu ray is not that, that cheap. It's, not like cheap. 30, it's like 35 bucks. Yeah. But you do get but, two movies for the price of one. But I would actually contend you really just get one movie because yeah. the other movie, you're never going to watch it once you've watched the other cut of the movie. There are some really good supplements. Too. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's a, there's a commentary, there's all kinds of stuff. But yeah, like mm -hmm. I don't foresee. Because I th I've thought about buying the Blu-ray already. I don't foresee me ever watching the other cut of the movie if I were to own the Blu-ray. Like, what would be the? It is such an inferior film in every sense of the in every sense of the word. Like, I would never watch it, even though it's only a 2K restoration. It's still a better movie, oh more compelling. God. Yeah, and the, and the and the restoration looks great. Like, it's not. I think sometimes people get a little bit baby by you know, like, oh, it's got to be 4K or nothing. It's like, listen. Uh, 
2K is great. I mean, 4K is, I mean, you can get it great, but like the fact that it's just been restored and preserved at all is is phenomenal. Right. And yeah, you can tell the scenes that were clearly cut in that aren't as high quality as the other scenes. But the mm-hmm. like you said, the fact that we have this at all is more the important part. So not to think that we wouldn't have gotten it when Avery Crowns passed away. But again, to your point, like who knows how his family would have handled any sort of things <laughs> left over. I'm glad that, yes, the version of this movie was known to exist. That was a director's cut and that Severin got it. And I mean, it's like the it's essentially like the I think it's like the crown jewel of that folk horror box, isn't it? In terms of like, um, I think in terms of American folk horror, I think it might be the only movie in that box. I would say so. Now, granted, I have not watched everything in that box because that box set is a mass. It is. It is a beast. It's um, like 17 movies, I'm pretty sure. It's a lot. I mean, it's glorious. This is not a complaint at all. But um, but yeah, I mean, just yeah, this is this is the film. And especially I think if anybody if you're somebody who's wanting to wet your whistle into the land of folk horror, this is this is a fine start. I, I agree. I think that this is a again a better than fine start as long as you make sure to procure the correct version of the movie. Because mm. not that you won't like it, it just may not it's not gonna hit the same. Yeah. You'll have to fill in more of the blanks. And again, not a problem, but it's just not a better. It's not a better. And yes. The ending. Oh. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, well, yeah, the ending is. Yeah. Yeah. The devil guard is not great. And <laughs> yes, the only American, the only United States full horror film in that box is Eyes of Fire. So there you go. I think that's I think that speaks volumes as to the importance of this movie in terms of an American entry into full core, which I guess full core is not really our forte. I guess that's a European thing. Like when I think of full core, I do tend to think of European films from the seventies. So, you know, which is fair, which is right. uh, like, I mean, the last full core movie I watched was men. And that came out last year. It's directed by Alex Garland. Like, and you know, it stores Rory Kinnear and it's set in England. Like I just, there's something about the UK countryside that lends itself to full core. Yes, yes, like uh, this is true. But that's a, I'm I'm actually going to stop myself because I could keep going on that. But uh, Eyes of Fire, preferably Cry Blue Sky. Either way, seek seek this out and and give some love in your heart to Avery Counts, people. Yeah, this movie is worth checking out. I mean, again, it's it's worth tracking down. It's worth doing the work to find it because again, the version on Shutter is just it's just it's just okay. It's not the movie that is worth putting as the crown jewel in your fucking folk horror box mm-hmm. it's $170 and, and and making a big deal out of the fact that you you now have it for the first time in ever because it's really never gotten a proper T. It didn't even get a DVD release. So, no. yeah. They skipped over so much and got us to Blu-ray. But yeah. Yeah, no this was this was a very interesting interesting movie i enjoyed it a lot so if this was your pick which i think it might have been like i i strongly yeah, suspect Heather. thank you i'm just gonna take that credit it was me unless yeah. somebody and, and if i'm wrong i apologize but i would pick it anyways because i love i absolutely as you as you guys have probably guessed i love i'm a bit of a fan i'm a fan of this movie um and, but i'm so just a little bit and i don't know but chris i have you to thank for for letting me if i did either way for going with it and coming with me on this journey yeah, no, I no, no, thank you for picking it again. It was it was a lot of fun and it was definitely a different kind of uh, a different kind of movie from what I was watching last week, which was the other, which was, uh, you know, the TV TV horror movie, the uh, Robert Mulligan. Oh, my God, I need to see that. Yeah. Robert Mulligan's all right. Yeah. I love I, him. That's direct. It's great. The, it's, the, it's, it's the Silver Fox, Robert. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Based off of Richard, uh, Richard Mulligan. I'm thinking Richard Mulligan. Sorry. It's a, uh, it's a based off of a Thomas Tryon book. I've heard of him. I've yeah. not read it. It's good. It's, it's worth checking out. I, 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 uh, I won't say anything else. I think it's, I think it's as good as this movie in terms of like something I'd never seen. That's kind of also hard to find a little hard to track down because it also is. I don't know. It's also its own kind of thing where it's like they're revert. I don't know. Like it's one of those things where people really like it and talk about it. But it's one of those things that I don't even think it has a release. Actually, you can just more. Maybe it does. I don't remember. I recorded that so long ago. This is this for me so far in terms of this year. Like this is a genuine thing that I'm like, I'm glad I watched this. So thank you, Heather. 
gosh, that makes my heart so happy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. No, no, thank you. So on that <laughs> note, we'll uh, we'll take a break and we'll play a preview for the next culture cast. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the group chat? I'm doing it again tonight. <laughs> no. Please. It's my mom's remembrance day. I just want to forget about it. I'll do it. Cannot go for more than 90 seconds. Am I clear? What happens after 90 seconds? <laughs> Don't want to stay. Light the candle to open the door. <laughs> Blow it out to close it. Put your hand on it. Now say, talk to me. Talk to me. the hand feel like? It felt amazing. I could see and feel everything on the other side. So my mom, she was trying to reach out. I'm here. Still been seeing stuff. You mean saying stuff? What if we open the door but we didn't shut it? I like you. They're not gonna stop. They're never gonna stop. Right on the next culture cast, we're going to be talking about a film that came out this year, 2023. I got Mike White to watch a new movie, folks. We're going to be talking about Talk to Me, a movie about trauma monsters you and, know, Ouija, when I hear, and Ouija boards. Oh, my goodness. When I hear Talk to Me, all I think about is this is song that Ace Fraley sings late on called Talk to Me. I have a feeling that two are not connected. No, probably not. <laughs> well, I've never heard that song, but I have seen the movie and it doesn't make an appearance. But I will say, Spoiler for that episode, not a spoiler for that movie. Mm. Definitely worth checking out. And I know you're not like always watching new stuff any more than I tend to, but it's definitely worth a watch. Uh, in terms of having heard of the hype, the hype, the movie living up to the hype, I think it, it lives up to the hype and then some. So very cool. I'll have yeah. to check it out. Yeah. So on that note, uh, Heather, where can people find you if they want to track you down? Well, I have a, I have a little thing called the Link Tree. And I don't know why I had to affect an accent because it's so fancy. Uh, but you can go to linktree.com uh, forward slash Mondo Heather. And there you will find my website, mondoheather.com. Uh, link to my Patreon, which is Mondo Heather. Uh, my Twitter, my Instagram, uh, articles, podcasts. I'm on Noise Junkies. I am one of the hosts along with my muchachos, Father Malone at HP, which is also part of the Weirding Way Media. You know, I get to occasionally get to be on Chris's show. Thank you, Chris, about this in a Bollywood cinema club and occasionally hear me on projection for. Yeah. So, um, you know, keep Make your the rounds as it were. I, I, you know, I like to be a little bit of a social butterfly with these things. But uh, but yeah, you can find me uh, over there. And as for me, same place, weirding. Well, my same place that you've mentioned, Weirding Way Media, uh, all the things that I work on can be found there. This show, Scary Stories We Tell. Columbo, Barney Miller, the list could go on, I could go on, but you should just go and look at weirdingwaymedia.com because if you haven't already, do it now. Um, this show, culturecast.com, patreon.com, 10, 20, and 50 are the levels you can get in at if you're interested in programming the months or getting access to the bonus episodes that we do. So that's where you can do that, but like, rate, and review the show wherever you get it because that helps out just about as much. Uh, Heather, thank you so much for joining me. It's been fun, as always. My pleasure, thank you. And uh, we'll catch you on the next episode. <laughs>